Well, there's a lot I want to talk with you all about today. I don't think I could ever possibly live up to the introduction, but that's so kind. Um, there's a reason why Burke is my son's godfather. And that's one of the many reasons why. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about our future in global health. And uh, we have a five-year strategy that many of us have been working on. And when I say us, I feel a little bit funny being up here because it's not me. I'm just the messenger. Um, this is us. Um, and this is a, a growing list of people who have all played a role and will continue to play a role in the growth of our global health informatics program. And there, as I'm looking out in the audience, I'm recognizing that the way I came up with this list probably was insufficient. And I know just for a fact I'm missing some people like Tim Briscoe and others. So apologies if you're not here, but there are many, many people that have been a part of what I'm going to present today. I want to talk a little bit about Regan Street's mission. I want to talk about GHI's mission as it relates to that, why we think global health informatics is important. What are the strategic areas that we would like to focus on? What populations do we want to serve? And what are the tactics? Like, how do we actually get there? And how will we uh, grow ourselves to be able to respond to the opportunity? And to maybe talk with you a little bit about our growth targets. And so um, we've been spending a lot of time as almost kind of like an interest group people that are interested in the discipline of global health informatics. But what we really try to do is take a step back and say, how can we uh, affect change in the world by working together on a common set of goals? And so that's really the focus today. And so maybe just to remind everyone, Regan Street's vision is a world where better information empowers people to end disease and realize true health. And the mission is to connect and innovate for better health. And so if and I'm probably biased because I do global health work, but I think if you are looking for a discipline that embodies um, this vision and mission, I think almost all roads will lead you to global health. And global health um, by its uh, very definition is about um, improving health equity and improving the world's health equity. Um, Paul Farmer is someone that Burke and I have both had an opportunity to meet, but I think he defines it well when he talks about health being a human right. And I think at the core of global health is this belief that health is a human right. But when we think about a human right, we think about like literally the health of the globe. It's different than public health or international health. A lot of people say, oh, you guys are the guys that are doing work outside of the United States. Well, that's actually not really a a specific or a more precise definition would be really focused around the health of the globe. There are some inherent problems that the whole globe faces, things like HIV and tuberculosis and malaria. The vast majority of issues around life expectancy um, are really um, a global issue. They're not an issue um, specifically outside the United States. In fact, um, some of the most impoverished populations we're currently working with, like the Native American population here throughout the United States. And so that's obviously a huge problem. Um, and, uh, and when you look at global health, what you realize is that oftentimes it affects the most impoverished, the most underserved. And so you'll go and you'll see that the greatest burden of disease is often in places like um, the, the sub districts of Kenya and, um, the, um, islands of the Philippines and the remote uh, vistas of Alaska that we were in last week. Um, and there's often a lot of issues around constraint and, um, an inability to do really big things with very little resources. And so collaboration tends to be kind of the, the way the game is played. And it's collaboration in a couple of different ways. It's collaboration from the vantage point of we have to work alongside those that we're serving because we can't possibly understand their culture. We can understand their context. And so we have to respect them as equals. We have to work in solidarity alongside those that we're serving. And we also have to work within the constraints of, of working within resource constrained environments. And so oftentimes, 
like for example, the project that Burke talked about open MRS, there was no way that we could have built a record system with the resources that we had. The only way that we could have done that work was through collaboration. And so one of the gifts of working in global health is I think it's really taught many of us what collaboration actually means. It's more than a word, it's actually a practice and it's a behavior and it's something that takes time to learn. And I can tell you that I did not understand it when we were starting. How many of you all are familiar with this device? Anyone, show of hands? No one, okay. So one of the things that I really respect and appreciate about global health is it's a petri dish for frugal innovation. So in this specific example, this device is responding to one of the biggest global health problems, which is maternal mortality and child mortality. So there are roughly 13 million high risk pregnancies every year. And in many of those cases, those high risk deliveries have real problems um, because of an inability to deliver a mother or deliver a child effectively. And so typically they'll use um, a cesarean section, an emergent cesarean section with very limited uh, physical facilities, or they'll use forceps, which we are increasingly understanding bring lots of risk to the child. And so uh, this is an example of a, a very low cost device that someone came up with in Argentina. And basically that bag is meant to place around the child's head. And then that device will ensure a safe delivery. And what's really impressive about the device is it costs about $6. And so when we think about uh, global health and we think about how we affect change, what we're thinking about is doing more with less, working within constraint. And it's a very different way of thinking about things. It's, it's almost the opposite of what we think about when we talk about the Precision Health Initiative. It's let's bring as many resources as we can to an environment to make the most precise treatment decision. Global health, on the other hand, is let's work within massive constraint and try to build something that is low cost and broadly deployable and can potentially have a global impact. So this, this notion, this discipline of global health, I think is actually really important, increasingly so, to even people like us. How many have, have, have I tricked with this diagram before? Show of hands. Okay, you're not allowed to answer. Um, this is a, a diagram that describes the relationship between expenditure on healthcare and life expectancy. And so as you can see, as you spend more on healthcare, life expectancy goes up. Make sense? So my question to you is, given this, where do you think the United States is on this graph? Do you have your mental model for where that is? Can you pick the dot on the page? Well, the trick is that it's actually not on the page. It's over here. The reality is, is that over the past three to four years, the national life expectancy in the United States has actually gone down. And so what we're learning is that, uh, at least in the United States and the UK, that spending more is not correlated with better health outcomes. There's actually a disconnect. And so I believe that the global health industry has a lot to potentially teach us here in the United States as it relates to working with less, working within constraint. Because what we've learned is that spending more doesn't actually lead to better outcomes. So what is global health informatics? So um, as I said, many of the clinical care environments that um, the world's underserved work within um, are uh, under-resourced. Um, there are less um, educated and less experienced health workers, but the level of disease severity is way higher. And so um, the, the idea behind global health informatics is applying the same kind of thinking around global health. It's how can we apply information technology within really constrained ways, within really resource constrained ways to affect broad systemic change. And I'm really happy to say that um, many of us in the room have helped to popularize this discipline of global health informatics through the work that we've done 
with projects like OpenMRS and uh, more recently OpenHIE, these, these opportunities to try to affect more systemic change in informatics, but in really kind of non-traditional ways that people even to this day don't fully really wrap their mind around. Burke and I get asked all the time, why didn't you sell OpenMRS? Why didn't you uh, make a commercial offering around that? Um, but to affect systemic change worldwide, we believed that the way to do that was by making it free, by building a community around it and letting ecosystems develop all throughout the world so that the opportunities were occurring to those who needed them, not to, not to Burke and I. We were actually trying to empower others. And so this is the whole kind of thinking around global health informatics and why we think it's important. So to maybe wrap all of this up, what I would say is if we come back to our mission and we think about um, what embodies that, I would argue, and obviously I'm biased, that this work, this global health informatics work is the perfect embodiment of that. So the question then becomes, how do we do more? We're not satisfied. We want to do more. We want to be more provocative. We want to be bigger. So I love two by two tables. Um, I feel like we started the global health informatics program, as I mentioned before, almost like a special interest group. It was people who shared the interest. And we were so focused on our projects that we've reached this phase. This is where we've been. More opportunities than we know what to do with. And where we want to be, obviously, is here, which requires that we put a strategy in place. But the thing that I've also learned by reviewing the literature is that it's really hard. And most organizations actually fail to execute strategy successfully. So I, I have the hope that we are the one of 10, but what I'm hoping is that after today, those of you around the room today will help us figure out how to be that one of 10. By, if I share the strategy that we've all come up with, maybe you can give us some advice on how to be better at it. So what are our strategic goals? We've got two. One is really focused around improving the health of the world's underserved through enabling responsible and sustainable electronic health record keeping practices. And I'll call that records. Every word in that was chosen for a specific reason, but I'll maybe focus on a few. Measurably, we want to be able to actually see what we've done. Um, enabling, so it's not doing, it's helping others. And sustainably, we're doing it in a way that others can carry forward above and beyond us. We're the Regan Street Institute. We're not the world's largest NGO. And so we want to find a way in which we can affect change that's more systemic in the community. The other strategic goal is um, helping improve information sharing practices within resource constrained environments. One of the things that we're seeing a lot of right now is that environments, emerging environments all throughout the world are really struggling to think about information sharing architectures. And they're wanting not to replicate the mistakes of the United States and other Western countries that have built out all of the health, their health information technology and uh, now have no or a very difficult uh, ability to interoperate and share their data between each other. And so many other environments throughout the world are asking the question, well, how do we not make the same mistake? How can we put our urban plan in place? And so we also have a strategic goal around helping countries measurably improve this, do differently. So what populations do we want to serve? So um, most of you probably are aware of the projects that we've done, and you think of us as the group that has focused in Africa. And there's a lot of reasons for that, because of the Empath project and because of some of the other projects that we've, you might have heard from us in WIPs and other uh, presentations, but that's only one part of the world. And so what we've done is we've actually split the world into three geographic regions, and we think that all three of them are important. And so there's the Asia Pacific region, and there's also the Americas region. And so we want to do work in all three of these regions as part of our growth strategy. What are our areas of focus? Well, we can't do everything. Um, so what can we as a small group of people do? We wanna focus on three specific areas. One, our communities of practice. I think what we've learned is that um, a real powerful enabler of change is to sit down with those that are trying to solve hard problems, sit alongside them and build community and let ecosystems form around them. So we've done that with a couple of examples, OpenMRS and OpenHIE, 
but I think that will expand. There are probably other communities that maybe we're not directly responsible for, but we need to sit within. And so we want to be more engaged in participating alongside other communities. And there are probably new ones that we haven't even thought of yet. But we want to build experience and world-class expertise around starting, engaging with, participating in, and leading communities, communities of practice. We think that's really important. Um, additionally, we want to be involved in capacity development. And so um, within constrained environments, one of the biggest uh, impediments towards change is know-how. And it's not because people aren't wise and smart, it's because they don't know what they don't know. In the same way I didn't know about um, collaboration, uh, uh, many people in these constrained environments don't know the simple things that you can do around information technology. And there's a lot of opportunity to empower others to uh, learn. So capacity development is really important at all different levels from e-health leaders down to systems designers. And we feel like we have a role in being able to affect change by building capacity. And then finally, um, we can't be in an ivory tower all the time. We have to be um, in the projects themselves. We have to be in the environments that we're trying to serve. And so for a couple of reasons, we want to be engaged in implementation projects, very specific examples of these um, high level strategic goals. And we want to be directly engaged, not only so that we learn from them, but also so that we can create positive examples that affect a change in the environment. So what we essentially want to do then is given those areas of focus and the high level strategy, we want to basically build a project portfolio. So now I'm talking Re Regan Street speak. So as you know, we can get grants and projects and uh, contracts. Um, and what we want to do is build a portfolio around each of these three areas. And so just to give you an example, as it relates to OpenMRS, we help found OpenMRS. Um, even though OpenMRS uh, now has a not-for-profit organization associated with it, Regan Streif uh, team members play a huge role in the OpenMRS community. And we want to continue to advance that core platform. We want to be the home, the world home to the technical and organizational leadership to the OpenMRS community. And we want to continue uh, fostering the OpenHIE community by serving as a secretariat here at the Institute. As it relates to capacity, we want to do one or more training programs that are hosted here by our program. And we want to start developing virtual or online uh, capacity development courses as well. So hopefully I'm giving you a taste of where we're headed. And then finally, um, as far as implementations, you remember my map, it shows the three geographic regions we would like to do for each of those two strategic areas, one or two projects per year. And so that would really uh, align with three or four projects for each geographic region. So that if you roll all of that up, you're talking 12 to 15 projects a year that would be externally funded. And to give you a sense of where we're at right now, it's between four and five. And so we're talking roughly a tripling in size. That's our hope and our plan. And more importantly, we, we're not gonna just, uh, because we help to create the discipline of global health informatics, we feel like we can influence the space around us. And so we're not going to just simply wait for grant opportunities to come to us. We're going to move to shape and influence them. We're going to work towards being involved in organizational boards and panels and do more business development opportunities so that we can see the change that we want to see and that we can uh, be not only beneficiaries of these uh, grant and contract opportunities, but also shape them. So how do we want to approach this from a personnel perspective? So we're coming up with some new vernacular and I'm sure these phrases aren't correct, um, but basically we're trying to create a big tent, kind of like the Institute, where um, there are a lot of people on campus and in the city and even around the world that are interested in global health informatics. Um, and we wanna create a, a place that they can come and learn and share with us and perhaps even work with us. Um, and so a team member is basically someone who uh, contributes to one or more projects. And that's either in kind or employed. So in some cases, there are those that are already funded here on campus and they come and participate on a project. In some cases, they're full-time members of our team that are working within the GHI program. 
A steward is kind of like a super team member and that um, they take on the additional responsibility of leading a part of the strategy. And I'll get into that in a second. And they oversee one to many projects. So there are those who participate in projects and there are those who lead projects. And then we have a special designation for an ambassador. And that's a team member who lives within the environments that we're trying to serve. So our hope and our, our dream is that in a few years, we have a member of the Regan Street GHI program whose full-time work it is to sit within each of these three regions and help affect the work and to be there on the ground full-time. So what that ends up coming up with is a model like this. And so right now, people like myself and Burke and Terry are leading all of these various projects, but I think in our future world, we will have stewards that are lead leading each of these. And our team, some of them have historically been staff members that have worked within the Institute for a while. Many of them are showing an interest, a passion and enthusiasm for helping to lead. And so our hope and expectation is that we grow from within and we grow externally and we will have eight to 10 leaders within the Global Health Informatics Program, eight to 10 stewards that are leading various aspects of this strategy. And then underneath a whole collection of others who might eventually evolve into leadership roles or might be really happy working in the role that they're currently within. And then ultimately, I think we wanna to get to a place where we're, we're actually able to um, dedicate some time towards actually growing the program. So right now we're also busy on projects. We have no dedicated time to grow the program. And so we're going to need to find a business model. And fortunately, I've been working in a really positive way with both Thane and Peter on a different model that allows us to have dedicated support time to just simply grow the program. So what does our program look like in three to five years? So I believe that we've started down the pathway of creating operational plans. We try to make those publicly available to you all, um, but we need to do better at that. And we need to align the operational plan around this more concise strategy that we've talked about. And so you'll be seeing more from us on that. We hope to establish these stewards in all of the domains. We wanna have at least good leads on people who are, will serve as our ambassadors. And we wanna have one to two externally funded projects per steward. So that gives you a sense of operationally what it looks like. But what's really more important is actually what, is our, what are our targets? Like, what are we trying to accomplish? And uh, Peter and Thane and the Institute challenged us to think about growth from a perspective of impact, from reputation and funding. And I'll share a little bit of what we shared with them. So um, from my perspective, by the end of year 2023, I think we're well positioned um, to be at a place where countries in all three regions would very publicly attest that we, our, our group, has some kind of role in advancing their health IT maturity, either through advancing patient record strategies or data sharing strategies. I think we're well on our way towards accomplishing that. Um, those of you in the room could probably nod your head in agreement. We're, we're engaged with countries in a pretty direct way right now, but we want to see it all the way through. We want to see them to a place where they're happy and successful and, and telling the world about it. Um, and that the communities that we continue to participate in and lead are internationally recognized as global public goods, that they are part of the fabric of the global health community. And um, finally, that we're cited in the literature, either the press, the literature, the, the research literature, as having a central role in systemic change in the global health industry. And that has to move beyond me and Burke and Terry. It has to move to members of our team as well. We have to grow our leadership and we have to grow the reputation of our team in order for us to grow the project portfolio. From a reputational perspective, I think most, um, if you were to go and ask, would say that Regan Street probably has the strongest reputation of the largest global health informatics program. But I think we have to continue um, doing that. We have to continue being in that position. Um, and uh, I think we have to also be at a place where we have multiple faculty that are leading full-time R&D portfolios around the strategy that I described. And my hope is that by the end of 2022, we have five people assigned and well on their way towards international reputation. And then finally, um, we wanna be a destination for training. 
Right now, we are providing training through our communities, but we want the world to know that if you want global health informatics training, that Regan Streif Global Health Informatics is the place you go. We want to build a reputation around that. From a funding perspective, if you look at the last year, our, our portfolio is somewhere between three and three and a half to four million dollars a year. I think we can grow that threefold. I think that's a that's a conservative estimate if everything from a structural perspective and a personnel perspective fall into place. And I think that funding comes from a very large diversity of sources. They're not typical sources. And so that's been um, an interesting um, transition for both the university and the institute to wrap their minds around, but we're making a lot of progress in that regard. And so we work a lot with development partners like USAID, CDC, PEPFAR, philanthropies like Gates, Rockefeller, and other foundations. But we also want to, I think, especially as it relates to our, our teaching, um, I think that there's a lot of opportunities to re-engage with NIH. I've been in conversations with the Fogarty International Center here recently, and I think the NLM and NIAID are also potential sources that we can put our energy into. Um, and then finally, we want to potentially um, pilot um, one or more value-added services. So I think that's another interesting way to sustain a core endeavor is to create some kind of um, secondary opportunity on top of the public goods and maybe host them here at Regan Street as a profit generating opportunity that would allow us to dedicate our time towards being able to focus on the growth of the program. So that was a lot um, and I, it was kind of a whirlwind, but I, I wanted to hopefully have a chance for questions, but uh, if not, then I appreciate everyone's attention. I can talk to you afterwards. Thanks. So first, uh, it's so good to hear uh, something as important as this uh, evolving and uh, having a north uh, that is uh, doable. So what, one of uh, uh, something that bugs me all the time about uh, global health and uh, compared to internal to a country like here, health, is um, the fact that um, when, when we are focusing on the clinical and, and, and the, the health specific problems, um, we, we tend to uh, be able to be more efficient than when we contextualize those solutions uh, to local regulations, laws, and finances, and et cetera. So I say that because I look at that, that uh, graphic with uh, cost expenditure on, on health, and I know what that number is showing is the amount of money that is not spent on the pure clinical or health components of the expenses, but in the regulatory, in the business around it, a, a number of other things. So I didn't see a lot of a political uh, uh, go, uh, nuances to the stra strategies here. And I wonder uh, if that wouldn't be a, a necessity uh, in, in something as uh, bold and, uh, and ch changing like this. Yeah, um, that's a really important point and observation, and it's a hard one to respond to quickly. But what I would say is that um, many of us have tried to approach this issue from different vantage points. And one is um, to force recognition of issues by creating something that is you have to respond to. So in the case of medical record keeping, there was um, almost a new cottage industry that was growing in the space. It was almost kind of like a reproliferation of commercial EMRs throughout Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, and in, in a model of constraint and with a leadership that didn't understand the implications of what that actually meant. Um, and that was left unbridled for a number of years. And uh, um, the open source model was a way to respond to that, not by politically grandstanding, but by helping those that we're trying to serve be empowered to do something different. And now we've reached the point where that model, that historical model of um, almost proprietary EHRs being developed with aid money, that's now the aid industry has created new rules that basically say you can't do those unless you're using public goods and you need to further invest your money into public goods in order for you to get aid. 
And so that's a way that we can affect systemic change by doing things. Um, but the other thing I would say that the top down approach is just building relationships with various countries and ministries of health. And we spend tons and tons of time talking to various countries and working behind the scenes and leading from behind, you know, like being just someone that they can talk to in an honest way about some of the issues they're faced with and trying to support them behind the scenes. And that's not really funded work, but it's probably some of the most important work that we do. So any other comments or questions? So if you don't, what I would ask, if, if I've gotten your attention in any way and you're interested in engaging and helping in some way, or if you have some friendly suggestions of how we can do this better, please let me know. I don't want to be one of the nine to 10 um, that fail. I want to be the one of 10 that succeeds. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it.